This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our next No Mentor webinar instalment, uh, hosted by Principal Content Designer Lauren Ellis. Uh, in today's webinar, Lauren is going to look at how we can improve services that directly deal with trauma and grief, and how we can design everything in a way that empowers, includes, and cares for people, no matter what task they're trying to do. She's going to talk about the science behind stress and anxiety uh, and how that affects uh, the way we read and comprehend information, drawing from real life experiences uh, and client work across the private and public sector. You're going to learn uh, some practical tips uh, of how to go beyond best practice and write in a human centred way. Uh, we are using auto generated captions uh, today. There is a chance some of these might get a bit muddled live, just as is the nature of them. Uh, but we'll make sure that these are all tidied up when we post the recording on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Uh, also, please do say hello to each other in the chat. Um, just make sure your chat settings uh, are set to panellists and attendees. Um, and if you've got any questions for Lauren, you can submit those using the Q&A feature um, or just drop them in the chat and I'll try and get through as many as I can at the end. Um, so yeah, over to you, Lauren, to kick things off. Hiya. Um, yeah, firstly, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, it's like two o'clock, so it's that kind of post-lunch slump. But um, hopefully this is a good session for everyone. So yeah, um, as Henry said, we're going to be talking about how we can design content in a way that empowers people, includes everyone, and just really kind of demonstrates the fact that we really care. I don't really need to tell anybody on this call that the words we use are important and the way that we communicate matters. And as content designers or practitioners of kind of any discipline, we know that language is really powerful. But while content design by nature and like the best practice that we do have is naturally quite inclusive and all the writing we do is kind of aimed at being accessible to everyone, there are things we can do that kind of go a bit further and better support people who are experiencing things like grief, trauma or anxiety. So that's why today we're going to be looking at how we can improve services that directly deal with those things. But we'll also look at how some of these tactics that we use specifically for people dealing with like grief, um, grief trauma and anxiety actually helps everyone as well. So no matter what task you're trying to do, whether you're affected by those things, sorry, the dogs just jumped off the sofa. <laughs> yeah, whether you're affected by those things or not, the measures that we can put in place in this way of writing really can just help everyone. So first of all, kind of why am I talking about this? Who am I? Um, so I'm Lauren, I'm a principal content designer at Nemensa. Um, I've been working on projects across the private and public sector since I think like 2016, which is showing my age slightly. But um, I've written for lots of different clients. So ones at like MS, Virgin Media, um, recently East of England, Ambulance Service, Ministry of Justice, Test and Trace, list goes on, um, the nature of being an agency. But um, a few years ago, I did a talk on designing for the dead. And that was something that we basically looked at why we needed to weave in kind of our own endings into the services and products we create, as well as um, taking ownership of our post-life wishes, especially around data usage and just our general kind of internet bound selves. But since then, um, my um, kind of like thinking around it has changed a little bit. I think um, having some stuff happen in like my personal life and death and grief have stopped being abstract concepts. And I've really seen up close how digital services can really accidentally be quite destructive when we're at our most vulnerable. So, <clears throat> In fact, um, while I was writing this, my granny died, which is one of the reasons that I had to postpone this talk. Um, she was called, so my granny was called Ina Meekin. She was a teacher, historian, artist, just all around brilliant human being. And even though she had no idea what UX was, I think she'll be happy that I was doing a training talk. So yeah, I won't dwell on this side so I'll get a bit teary. But yeah, so aside from personally dealing with grief, I've also had to work on a number of projects where people have been kind of directly impacted um, by trauma, anxiety, or experiencing grief themselves. So this includes creating content for people who are at the highest risk of COVID-19, um, people who have been the victim or witness of a crime and therefore need to report it to the police and go through the court process. And then also people who have been failed by the healthcare authorities and are then trying to submit like freedom of information requests. So speaking to participants in these projects really brought home how a small usability error or an innocent organizational quirk can really make Thing that's already a terrible personal experience even worse so at the back of all this i started to try and think a bit more practically so how can we try and make services kinder and more compassionate and how can we write in a way that doesn't just meet the practical needs of the user but also their emotional needs as well because ultimately we've all got skin in the game um, we're all going to have um, difficult life experiences we're all going to lose loved ones and just mind the thing that my dad said to me um quite a long time ago now 
but just that it's inevitable that at times bad things and bad people will come crashing into your life and what matters is how we respond to it and as practitioners we're in this really unique position where it comes when it comes to responding to these bad things because we've got the chance to kind of take those negative experiences and then turn them into actions to make it a bit easier for the next one along we get to make the world a little bit better and those changes may feel um, may feel small but they do have a big impact even if it is like a corner of an edge case on a service that you don't think many people interact with it does have an impact and it does help people and I think that's the reason that most of us get into this kind of design to begin with so today we're going to be looking at how um, emotions impact understanding um, also how our own emotions can actually kind of subtly leak into our content and distort meaning and how we can stop that and then also how to write with empathy and for people who have got anxiety so first of all We'll do a little, little bit of a quick tour of this. I think this is meant to could literally be an entire talk of itself. Um, but basically, when we're stressed, the world gets really, really, really small. You know, the blinkers go on and nothing else aside the thing that is upsetting us really matters. And the way that we feel, process and move through our emotions is wonky and inelegant and irrational. And it's like the little monkey brain that you see um, in this Homer Simpson picture that kind of takes over in times of distress. And it just means that anything outside of the thing that's stressing us, our capacity to be able to do it just becomes way more difficult. And those everyday things become kind of insurmountable, which makes kind of everyday life hard, but it also makes understanding online content even more difficult. This is because um, emotions play a really big part in the way that we read and process information. Um, research has found that um, the more stressed or anxious we are, the harder it is to read, understand, remember, make decisions, as well as like pausing and reflecting. A good example of this is just before I joined this call where I couldn't work out how to open Zoom because I was a little bit nervous. So happens all the time, whether it's a big thing or a small thing. Um, trauma as well also has a really detrimental effect on our ability to read and concentrate. So this means that if someone does have PTSD, they might struggle to make sense of information. And then that's kind of doubly difficult when someone might be engaging with content that kind of directly relates to the um, what caused their trauma to begin with. So it's just really important that we remember that our users are going to meet us in all kinds of different emotional contexts. And these emotions aren't necessarily going to be the ones that are directly related to a service. So, for example, if you're um, arranging a funeral, you might feel grief. But then there are also those emotional, um, the emotions that kind of exist in the background while you're doing tangential tasks. So if you're trying to find a map to a courthouse, if you're trying to testify, for instance, or um, back when we were in the pandemic, trying to find a testing center when you or yourself were sick, what you or your child was sick. So even if we're just doing something as small as kind of checking the council website to find out when our bins are going to be collected, we have that whole kind of symphony of stress and preoccupations and nagging thoughts that are just rattling around the backs of our heads. So the thing that we have, the, the most challenging thing for us as practitioners is trying to get that emotional element right when we're designing services, but it's not necessarily easy and it's especially hard given the fact that we all have our own histories, we've got our own emotions and anxieties around certain topics and it's not easy to write about them when you're also kind of trying to personally reconcile with those topics yourself. So how do we write about the big scary things? Um, one thing humans do, and it's quite normal, is that we use language to kind of hide, distort or conceal meaning. And this isn't a malicious thing. Um, it's just that some things are quite hard to talk about. And yeah, we kind of try and put a little bit of cushion between um, what we're saying and what the person's hearing. And we use um, euphemisms for death as an example. So gone, past, left us. Um, there are so many um, euphemisms for death. Um, this um, grave here actually is one that's near me and it's one of my favorite graves. It's a weird saying favorite grave, but um, I really like it because it's got resting and kind of quotation marks, which feels vaguely ominous and like they're only temporarily resting. So yeah, they are everywhere, um, not just on gravestones, but um, even when I was getting pet insurance for my puppy, um, I had policy terms like farewell cover, which I understand why they don't want to explicitly say what that is, but I also then didn't understand what it was and had to look into it. So we tend to use um, euphemisms like this when we're talking about something that is kind of difficult to talk about or something that culturally we see as taboo. Um, sometimes these euphemisms are completely harmless. So we can have ones like bun in the oven, for instance, which 
just kind of seem silly but aren't really actually concealing anything and sometimes they could be humorous but a lot of the times um we use them when we're trying to I don't know I think they could basically signify a broader discomfort that we have with a topic and they create a bit of distance between kind of like what we're saying and what we can't say so it's that just that bit of um psychological safety I guess being like it's over here and we're over here this is really normal um humans do it all the time you know because at our core we're all quite messy and unsure even within ourselves and so it's almost inevitable that this kind of uncertainty is going to leak into our communication as well and I'm not immune to this at all I've been using them a lot this year since my granny died um whenever I had to like tell people about her I kept saying this kept saying you know she'd passed away rather than died and it's because died felt really harsh and really sudden especially when people were asking me how my uh, Christmas holiday was so saying passed away felt a little bit softer it felt like it was less of a shock to whoever I was speaking to and just wasn't quite as much of a slap to the face at certain points but this is all right in everyday conversation even though it can be kind of confusing for children especially if you are talking about death but as practitioners that are creating and designing and improving services we don't really get to hide from these topics and we have got to make sure that we are being clear so euphemisms and idonyms and all of the common sayings um, are confusing for users and um, this is the case for people who might not speak English as their first language. Um, I did have a case, um, a call the other day where I said that all my chickens had come home to roost. And then someone asked me if I had pet chickens, which I regrettably do not. But um, yeah, they get lost in translation sometimes. And also sometimes people have got neurodiverse needs, which mean that they kind of struggle with metaphors or take things literally. So we just kind of want to avoid them where possible because quite often when we're trying to distance ourselves what we're really doing is concealing or concealing meaning and making things more complicated than it needs to be so we're adding unnecessary words and just creating distance between kind of a clear action and what someone needs to do and I think the broader thing what I really want to draw home is that euphemisms do more than just muddy understanding so compassion and dying which is a really good charity that has a lot of um, very good information around like talking about death and grief in general and um, basically say that euphemisms reinforce the idea that important end-of-life conversations are taboo and by extension when we use euphemisms we're also kind of telling people that their experiences or their identities are taboo so it's kind of pushing people out without really realizing it so I'm using euphemisms as a, well as an example of how even though we're all mostly aware of how we need to be conscious of or actively challenge where our biases might slip into our writing we need to be really careful as well where our own emotions, fears and anxieties might leak in as well. So one thing we can do is when we are writing something, um, we should probably ask ourselves, you know, why are we choosing to avoid saying what we really mean? Um, are we unsure of what words to use? Are we afraid of offending or saying the wrong thing? And who are we excluding by not considering our language? Um, so yeah. The next part I want to talk about really is how empathy is your superpower but um, it also can be something that can get in the way. So a bit of a story time here. So last year um, I was working on a project with a government department where we were basically helping people who had been either a victim or a witness of a crime. Um, the site hosted information about the court process, um, calling the police, what they can expect like throughout that process. And we did some bits of work with them, including like doing a content review, we revised the IA came up with a new tone of voice and ran multiple rounds of user research with people who'd been like victims or witnesses of crimes, had gone through the court system and then also had um, disabilities or neurodivergent needs. As well as doing a like, general usability and comprehension testing with them, we really wanted to investigate how the content could better support people's kind of emotional needs in this circumstance because I don't know, no one's going to be going on this website on a good day. It's not exactly like pleasure reading or doing it because you've got a quite a serious task that you need to complete. So what we were doing was basically trying to ask around like questions around um, how people felt when they're actually looking for the content. So what the kind of broader emotional context um, the users had when using the website. We also wanted to look at where structure and prioritization could actually reduce stress and make users feel safer. And um, one of the participants we spoke to um, said that when she was going through the court process, before she reported it to the police, she was actually living with the person that was kind of the <clears throat> was her abuser so she was not able to engage with the content all of the time it was in these little 
short windows of time when she was actually able to, which um, led us to looking at certain features like that safe exit button that kind of floats on the screen that just basically allows people to leave the site quickly and without leaving a record of the fact that they've been there. Um, and then we also wanted to look at what content participants actually needed and if anything was missing from that site. The project itself was really rewarding, but um, and I think actually it's one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on. But for me, it kind of came quite shortly after I'd actually had to report a crime. And it just meant that going into the project, I had these like very big opinions about what was working in the court system and what wasn't. Um, I was also aware and could remember really horribly how difficult it was to find information that was actually helpful. I can remember like, the anxiety and uncertainty and stress of not only dealing with the kind of admin side of having to report all of this, but also emotionally reacting to it. So even though I had this big well of empathy, wasn't actually very helpful. Um, it did mean that I was better um, able to really advocate for the people who were using the service, but I had to really keep reminding myself, you know, as much as you have these opinions, the research has to speak for itself and had to really kind of separate myself from um, kind of, I don't know, making it my like, vendetta or whatever <laughs> to fix everything I thought was wrong. So what, do you, what can you do? And if you are in a situation where your kind of own experiences do you kind of rub too closely against what you're working on and you have a lot of empathy, but you don't want to let it get in the way. So I've got some tips for doing this basically that I kind of learned. So doing your research seems really obvious, um, but research is basically what keeps us objective when our own experiences are a little bit too close to what we're working on. And it also means that we're kind of capturing the voice needs and priorities of people using the service. And yeah, and you can, structure your research in a way that looks at the immediate needs as well as the emotional ones as well. Um, you can't fix what people are feeling, but by doing research, you can kind of preempt where their anxieties may get worse or where there might be bottlenecks. And you can just basically you like write in a way that preempts and stops some of these anxieties from getting worse. Um, and you can also meet people where they are. Um, so no matter what we're designing or writing and no matter how far away from those kind of like big scary topics um, the service might be, people could be really stressed or confused or anxious and we need to try and kind of not add to that wherever we can. Instead, we want to be testing, refining, testing in to just make sure that it's as easy as possible for users to find, use and navigate a service. And then also prioritizing what's most important so that people can kind of dip in and out and engage when they want to and how they want to. And yeah, some of this is kind of like content design best practice, but it's a good way of kind of framing a way of thinking. Another thing to do is try and understand and really mark down at the difference between empathy and sympathy in your writing. So writing out, you know, I'm sorry that you're dealing with this may, may feel like we're kind of being kind, but quite often we're kind of just getting in the way. Um, I often think of this as, you can see it on websites or services where it seems like the organization wants to say something rather than the user actually needs to know this. So yeah, we should try not to apologize or overly sympathize. Quite often this content is just gonna lengthen sentences. It's gonna eat up time and just basically put more waffle between what the user needs to know and then how they're gonna act on it. So instead we wanna be using kind of clear direct language and we wanna um, really demonstrate our empathy by using terminology, structure and language in a way that makes people feel supported and empathized with without us explicitly saying it. So yeah, it's not about the words you used, but the way that you're approaching it to begin with. And another reason to kind of avoid that sympathetic content is that we might be making assumptions about people's experiences that aren't necessarily accurate. So even if we think we're being kind in language, it can have this kind of judgmental or implicit kind of bias in it. So it says to users that we understand what their lived experience is like. And we attempt to even say like, we're sorry, but we understand what you've been through. But truthfully, we don't know what they've been through. And if you take grief, for example, not everybody experiences it in the same way. And not all deaths are the same. Death can come after a really well-lived life, a long illness. You could have had a really complicated relationship with a person who's died. And so suggesting that someone should feel a certain way could end up making them feel quite isolated or alienated or even quite guilty. Um, so it's goodwill intention, like um, very like well-intentioned, but quite often can um, not only make things longer and more difficult to actually engage with, 
but have the opposite effect than you intended. Um, similarly, we wanna be using people first language. So I'm only gonna really briefly talk about inclusive language on this, but I will just plug that we're, Hannah and I, so one of my colleagues at Nemansa are doing a talk on um, inclusive language in May, I think. So we'll dive way more into the topic there, but for the purpose of keeping this kind of within the 45 minute mark, um, I'm only gonna go through a few kind of inclusive language points. But yeah, so another way that we kind of see implicit judgment coming into our language is when we're talking about people with disabilities. So but like three examples here where it's living with versus suffering from, affected by versus victim of, or people with a disability versus the disabled. The, the first example on each of those bullet points is accurate, positive, and kind of retains the dignity of the person. Whereas the latter really just brings in that, um, brings in that judgment statement, which isn't accurate and doesn't center the person, it kind of centers the disability. So we wanna use kind of people first language wherever possible, just to make sure that we're not kind of alienating anyone or making those unfair like judgments really. Another thing we can do to um, show empathy is that we use real life examples. So these could be things like testimonials, case studies, quotes, and they could be kind of anywhere on a digital estate. But hearing what is from real people rather than from an organization really helps people to feel more understood. Um, it can empower users to make them feel like they're more in control and also that their experiences matter because you're gonna, you see yourself in people. Um, studies have also shown that people re actually remember information more easily when storytelling is used. Um, the UX is among us, we know this is the story bias or narrative bias, but it basically just really means that we're grounding users and contextualizing what we're saying. It empathizes with them and just generally makes it easier to understand and remember content. Another thing to do is use their language. So, as I said before, like language is this really powerful thing that literally shapes your brain chemistry. But the way that we use it can be quite negative sometimes. Um, it can add to myths, it can block people from accessing services, or it can include and bring people in. So there are some ways that we can kind of use people's language and that's by um, like writing simply, explaining complex terms, removing jargon. But we can also use like direct affirmative content to make people feel more seen, heard and recognized within a service this like human-centered human approach just means that we're kind of building trust by reflecting back people's actual experiences rather than making assumptions around like how they want to be kind of spoken about or gen um, how they're going to be spoken about. So yeah, just basically not making generalizations. And if you don't really know where to start with this, um, something you can do is like a quite simple way is doing some keyword analysis. Um, so seeing how people are kind of referring to themselves, what they're searching for. But you can also um, ask in research sessions as well. Um, I'd also recommend talking to community groups and charities. There's so much excellent information online. And so um, it's definitely worth kind of having a look around to see how people actually want to be spoken about. Um, ultimately, the kind of best way to actually demonstrate our empathy for a group of people or a product, service, whatever, um, is by doing that hard work of making things simple. That's the old like GDS saying, but in this context, it really means that like compassionate design isn't the words that we choose. The words are almost like the last thing. It's in the way that we frame topics, it's in the way that we think about things. So those conversations you have and research that you do before you press publish. So it's kind of like less about what you actually say and it's more about what's omitted and what's left out. And it's all that kind of, I don't know, all the hard work really happens before anything even appears on a user's screen. and it seems, I don't know, it can seem like it's more in like plain English or there's not that much personality, but that's ultimately the kind of kindest thing to do at certain points. And we can really demonstrate our empathy by just advocating for users behind the scenes and demonstrating that we care by testing and iterating and just making a service as good as it possibly can be. Um, I have a little bit of coffee now. <laughs> um, so writing for anxious brains is kind of similar to um, the empathy section, but humans are naturally risk averse. Um, some people try and reduce anxiety by kind of learning as much as they can about a situation. So they feel better able to fit. Sometimes people might want to ignore it altogether, but um, either way, and however anyone wants to actually deal with their anxiety, the main thing we want to do is not overwhelm people with information. 
um, if we give them too much information, it's only going to add to that anxiety and then compound with the stress and just make it even harder to concentrate and remember information. So given that people kind of sometimes really want a lot of information, sometimes want the absolute bare minimum, we need to try and figure out a way that we actually kind of balance these conflicting needs. So ways we can do this are by kind of reassuring them that they're in the right place to begin with. So no matter what web page you land on on the internet or what you're doing, you want to know that you're in the right place and doing the right thing. Um, and this is especially the case if you're already anxious or you're doing a task that is going to make you anxious. So we can reassure people at the start and then also at kind of timely moments throughout. So it doesn't have to be that overly sympathetic stuff, but just just subtly telling people and guiding them in the right way and giving instructions and guidance at the right points. Um, and also um, explaining why we're asking certain questions. So um, if you're working on something that requires users to share a lot of information, just kind of like reassure them and explain like why you're asking it and they might be more willing to actually share that information instead of kind of getting their heckles up. Another thing to do is help them prepare. So this is something that um, the gov.uk design system does really well already. So if you're ever unsure, just uh, mix my dish from them, I say. Um, so yeah, if your service requires people share a lot of information, as well as explaining why we're asking that information, we need to kind of warn them in advance. Um, there's going to be loads of points where they may need to exit the service and try and preempt them and stop that from happening. So um, you need to kind of let people know at the beginning, but it doesn't have to all be this like giant long start page because most of the time people just skip through that anyway. So a good way, a good thing to do is just doing some research to find out where those kind of stopping points are. And then also asking participants, you know, like, are they immediately gonna know the answer to this? And um, do they need to like go and find that information? Another thing is um, if your service does require that they share that information, try and make sure that they're able to actually save and come back so they don't need to do it all at once. Um, you also wanna make help obvious. So everybody benefits from having well signposted support. Um, even if you don't necessarily need it, it's quite reassuring to know that it is there. So it's kind of supporting a couple of different um, capacities when it comes to kind of anxiety, grief and trauma. Um, <clears throat> there's the actual kind of customer service element of it where um, people who are like trying to complete a service may need extra support if they are um, anxious. So we want to make sure that that help is kind of clearly available, but also that there's a human at the other end if possible. Um, if there isn't, make sure that it's clear when they can expect a response. So we'll get back to you within like 24 hours. And then the second kind of support content to provide is if you are going to be to, um, kind of discussing kind of difficult topics or information that might be like triggering to some people, signpost to charities and support groups and just kind of support them in that um, like support them in that way by saying, you know, you can go here if you need some help and there's yeah, nothing. It's a good thing. Anyway, um, set your expectations. So I think we've all probably been in situations where you kind of begin a task, you think it's going to be quite quick and then suddenly you've been doing it for about an hour or so, which is really annoying for people in general, but it's also something that is going to make people who are anxious even more anxious. Um, telling people how long a task is going to take is going to allow them to actually make a decision whether or not they want to do it, if they have time to right now or they can do it later. And the people who actually avoid tasks that seem a bit too daunting. So um, I, I do that constantly. If it seems like it's going to be difficult, I will put off doing the task if I can. Um, but yeah, by putting a bit of like a time um, exp um, estimate, it may make it seem like it's actually going to be a bit easier than you think and just kind of opens up the service a bit more. Um, if you have an analytics team or someone managing um, like analytics within your organization, you can speak to them about it. It's not always as clear as like time spent on a page because people will open up a page and leave it for ages. But there are things you can do within Google Analytics where you almost like have tags throughout the journey where um, you can see how long it takes them to kind of complete it. But even if you don't have that data available, even doing a rough estimate is helpful. Um, it just means that people are kind of empowered with information and can decide to do it whether um, if they want to. You also wanna make sure that you're giving people plenty of time. So when we're anxious, we're either going to take way longer to complete a task because we're worried we're going to do it wrong or we skip through it, we scan, we don't really understand what we're doing, we just pick up random bits of information that become kind of muddled in your mind. So what we can do as practitioners is not for, don't force urgency unless you absolutely need to. Um, if there is a time limit, 
make sure it's kind of as generous as possible so that people actually have enough time to um, engage with the content and make decisions without having to start the entire process again. So if the service times out for whatever reason, so um, for instance, if you can't store data on a web page after like 20 minutes of activity, we should warn people this is gonna happen. And then there's a time limit as well. Um, so if it's an application, for instance, that can only be stored for like 30 days unfinished, we need to then explain to people like why that's happening and then remind them about it. So whether that's by kind of text, email, whatever like notification system you've got set up, this basically means that um, they don't have to start again because that's also very annoying and stressful. So a big one is explaining consequences. So we not only need to make sure that we're giving users all the information they need to make an informed decision, we also need to tell them like what's gonna happen depending on how they answer. So um, if you're, for example, trying to apply for a new credit card, you're gonna have to have a credit check done. And then you need to know what effect that's gonna have on your credit score, whether or not you're willing to do that at the moment, and then kind of make an informed decision from there. So by empowering people with information at the right point, it just means that they're able to complete that task with confidence. So with that um, credit card example, you might wanna warn them at the beginning because if you get all the way through and then find out that it's gonna actually have a detrimental effect on your credit score, when you're about to like get a loan or something, you might be less willing to do it. Um, I'd really just say though that we really shouldn't be afraid to lengthen journeys by adding like moments of friction or pauses that explain consequences or kind of split journeys up. It may seem like kind of contradictory that we normally want to be creating this kind of like quick and seamless design that's really easy to move through, but some tasks need to take longer and that is not a bad thing. That's kind of like what's actually needed. And if you're ever unsure about um, whether or not you're providing enough information um, or if the guidance that you're actually including is clear enough, test it with users, see what they think, and then just kind of improve it from there. And then you want to design endings. So um, to kind of badly paraphrase T.S. Eliot, service should end with a bang, not a whimper. Um, when things happen too quickly, it can make people feel like the task is kind of out of their control or the decision has been made for them and it just kind of suddenly happens to them, which is the opposite of what we ever um, want to make our users feel. So this is a bad practice when we're just doing like a normal task, but it's like really bad if that task then has like a significant personal consequence for a person. So they're um, again, like applying for a loan or something. So what we want to do is basically make clear that make it really clear that they've actually finished the task and then provide guidance around what happens next and um, when they can expect to get a response, what format it's going to be. Um, the, yeah, the gov.uk design system confirmation page is another really good example of this because it just really neatly ties up the experience and leaves users feeling reassured. And then if you can also partner that with even just like a reference code that if they do need to reach out again, they can just use that code to have their um, inquiry kind of pull back up. So yeah, just pay attention to the end as much as the beginning. I think we kind of services just kind of whimper out at certain points. So make it really clear that the task is finished, they're all done and they can just move on to whatever's next. So kind of just as how with accessibility, um, some of these things are kind of essential for some people, but helpful for everyone. Writing with anxiety, my anxiety in mind is just better for everybody really. Um, it can really help people who have got like low literacy, cognitive impairments, visual impairments, motor impairments, low um, non-fluency. Um, it just really kind of brings everybody along by writing in a way that is simple and like friendly and open. So yeah. Oh, I'll just skip through. So um, to kind of conclude, I just wanted to go through kind of five final lessons I've learned throughout the process of trying to write um, content in a way that really includes everybody. So the big one I think is stop trying to make every interaction delightful. Um, good UX can't fix real world problems and emotions. Some things just suck. Um, and also some tasks are mundane and boring, but unavoidable and essential. So if you're trying to pay your electricity bill, for instance, sometimes the best we can do is just try and make an experience as quick and as neutral and as painless as possible. And that's all right, that's perfectly fine. Um, we as people and as kind of practitioners, we're never gonna necessarily enjoy doing certain activities, but we might remark at the end of it that it was a bit easier than we thought it was gonna be. And 
we also might not think anything of it at all. We just complete the task and it's gone. So that may seem like the opposite of what we want to do when we're designing things, but in some ways that passiveness is actually a massive win because you just kind of help them do what they need to and then just completely get out of the way. Um, another thing is not being afraid to kind of reveal what's behind the curtain. So when um, this is to do with a project I worked on last year where um, people were quite suspicious of the government, sometimes for like quite good reasons, but quite often when we don't know what the answer is, our minds are kind of instinctively going to go to the absolute worst thing. But in reality, things go wrong because systems aren't perfect. People aren't perfect. We then create systems that all of our own kind of um, imperfections and leak into. But it's like most of the conspiracy theories, um, it's more often a human error and then our natural inclination to try and hide the fact that we've messed up than anything actually devious going on. But that's not to say that people are distrustful sometimes of large organizations or governments, depending on their personal experiences. And sometimes they've got quite good reasons for that. So for something we can do is just try and design in a way that really promotes transparency and, account and accountability. Um, we need to be making next steps, actions and outcomes really clear and just trying to basically slowly loosen up those shadows and suspicions around a service. Um, so pulling back that curtain, showing a little bit of vulnerability just means that we can swap out some of that uncertainty with trust. And I know this kind of looks different for every organisation and it might not be appropriate. Um, we don't want to be kind of too relatable when we're designing something that is just for um, know, submitting a tax return. But it's worth doing some research to figure out what this actually looks like for you. Um, something we did it um, on that project was create like anti-personas. So it was almost like designing for the outcomes that we didn't want and trying to bring the people that we knew weren't happy with the service kind of background on our side. So it was quite an interesting um, design challenge, that one. The thing is, so today, me, tomorrow, the anyone who's familiar with Memento Mori kind of artwork and that will know that's a bit of a one of those um, a common motif. But as practitioners, we're kind of constantly treading this weird balance between being a user and designer of services. So um, with this observer and participant, and sometimes, as I was saying before, the projects we work on impact us directly or the impact a loved one. And sometimes we'll speak to, to participants whose experiences feel really quite uncomfortably close. And our teammates aren't always going to want to talk to us about it. Um, they won't always tell us if a service is impacting them directly and they really shouldn't have to. Um, but what we can do is just kind of look after each other and create an environment where you can be vulnerable without having to go into specifics. So just kind of leading with empathy and extending it as far upward as you can. And that also means extending empathy to your stakeholders as well. So long ago, back in like the middle of the pandemic, I did do a stint with Test and Trace um, and people were really stressed at that point of time because, you know, it wasn't just your usual um, got to meet this deadline stress. People were stressed on a personal level. So it was the, am I going to be OK? <laughs> am I going to see my family again? Um, and then there's also all of the professional stress as well, because this was a service that impacted everybody in the nation. There was a lot of scrutiny and yeah, it was just a lot of pressure on people. And then there's also that kind of broader existential stress, the fact that it was kind of impacting us on like a human level and on a species level. So this project really just taught me a lot about working with people who are under immense pressure, but are trying the best they can to get the things done. Um, we're hopefully not going to have to um, spin up another service in the middle of a pandemic, kind of fingers crossed. But we may get dropped into high stress projects or environments and have to quickly kind of catch up with what's going on. And we're not always going to understand why when we arrive on those projects, um, why decisions have been made or how we've got somewhere. But it's really important to remember that everyone, like even the scariest of stakeholders or biggest boss is a human as well. They've got all of those worries, all those stresses. And just try and give them the same grace um, you would like your teammates and also your participants. Um, so yeah, just make sure that um, kindness extends out as far as possible. And then also don't do it all alone. I think um, sometimes this pressure we feel to try and get the words right is like so big that it can feel quite terrifying and it's especially difficult when we're writing for services that involve people like um, vulnerable users and the last thing we ever want to do is like re-traumatize or upset anyone by saying the wrong thing so if you are ever unsure just ask um, ask the people on your project ask people in your team ask other content designers and then just the broader community as well um, content design really is a team sport 
you don't need to have all of the answers. It's all right to get it wrong. Um, I think inevitably we all get things wrong. And that's why we do, it's why we do research, it's why we iterate, it's why we test things. And then it can, um, I think content design is why we've got a quite a good community of people wanting to share information. So just ask around. There's a lot of really good guides online as well. Um, just yeah, don't don't feel like you need to know all of it. But also just make sure as well that you're actually taking care of yourself. So writing for some of these kind of like topics can be quite heavy. So just make sure that you're kind of keeping some compassion for yourself and you're not reluctant to take breaks if you need to. And yeah, just never be afraid to like step back or be like, this is a bit much for me. Um, yeah, your team will respect you. And if anything, I think when people are like a little bit vulnerable, it encourages other people to be as well. So yeah, never feel bad about that. But like, I did kind of just want to end on a bit of a positive note as well, because um, as difficult as some of these topics can be, both kind of personally and professionally, they are really important and they're worth talking about. Um, and as strange as it may kind of sound for me to say, it's actually quite an exciting time to working in this sector. Um, this is really a growing area of content design that's kind of constantly evolving and improving. And there's so much expertise out there and there are a lot of really talented people doing great work that they're happy to share. Um, there's loads of really good charities. Um, I could like list so many of them out, but yeah, I think it's a really good time to be learning more about this because we're only going to improve and we're only going to make it better for everybody. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions that you don't want to like put in the chat or just want to kind of talk about outside of the session, um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm also always really keen to learn more about this. This is an area of content design that I'm really interested in. So you know any other like little facts or anything please let me know so yeah thank you that's the end so if anyone has any questions amazing thank you Lauren. what um yeah a brilliant talk like i think so much of what you spoke about i think really resonates with everyone who watching um and yeah yeah so thanks so much for your information and also for you know sharing sharing your personal story too um and yeah thank you to everyone that joined us um uh, and have also joined in the discussion in the chat. I can see there's been lots and lots of messages there. Um, we do have time for some questions. Um, if you have submitted your question in the chat, I may miss it because there's been a lot posted in there. So uh, but please do uh, uh, just chuck that in the Q&A feature instead, just so that's not missed. Um, but yeah, Lauren, to kind of pick up on kind of something you touched on, kind of you mentioned if the best outcome for our users is sometimes that they feel neutral kind of about a service how how can you then kind of communicate that value to stakeholders um so i think sometimes it's just not getting complaints so um if you've got like a comms team or a call center for instance or anybody managing like inbound inbound inquiries checking with them to see if they're getting like less kind of calls questions complaints that's going to kind of demonstrate that that service is working um regardless of the kind of organization you work for reducing demand on those call centers is going to benefit them it's going to save money and just mean that teams are freed up to work on other stuff um and also you can look at things like how successfully people are able to actually complete tasks are you getting more applications through are you getting um less kind of like problems and dropout rates as well so yeah i think someone's like looking for the lessened negative outcomes um um so we have uh lots of questions now appearing in the in the q a um first question from michelle uh michelle asks um how do you balance the desire to avoid euphemisms uh so that we're clear in our content and the desire to mirror the language that our users use um uh, so michelle yeah. says all right bereavement content um and when we speak with our users they use euphemisms const uh, constantly um we want to reflect their language, uh, but that can compromise our clarity and accessibility. Our stakeholders want no euphemisms. Our users uh, uh, that we talk to like them because it feels softer and more compassionate. Um, those are their words. Uh, how do you navigate that? That's a really good question because it is on one side, like you should be absolutely mirroring um, like people's actual language. And I think especially if you're speaking to a person or it's in a case study or something like that, mirror their language, use those euphemisms. So I think if someone, and anyway, we want to be meeting people like where they are. And if this is how much, if this is how they want to speak about something, we should mirror that language. I think if it comes to 
kind of more for, like public facing content when you do really need to have that clarity for absolutely everyone then kind of steer away from the euphemisms and try and be a bit clearer but ultimately like if your users are preferring that language and that's what you're finding in conversation and in research and everything else like the research is the thing that you should be following um yeah so mirror, mirror the language i think it does make people feel more understood but there's a really interesting kind of content challenge to have um yeah i don't know if i've answered that i feel like i've just gotten i agree with the report <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not, not. Okay. So the rules are never um i don't know the whole point of rules is like knowing at which points to break them and research is what shows you when and where you can kind of flex things yeah it must be so so difficult trying to balance that um so it's so one next question um uh, oh there's lots of people asking if the presentation and slides will be shared um yes they will uh, we will be sending a link um out probably tomorrow morning kind of once we've um just got that uploaded for you um uh, so our next question, uh, Emma asks, uh, how do you manage um, with the use cases where you may not be able to find end users to test with? Uh, so this is, so there's a couple of different things. So one of the things that we do um, at Nementa is we work with different research partners um, that help us to connect with people from like particular groups, for instance. But and one really good way is actually working with charities. So um, when we were trying to find people for that piece of work for victims and witnesses of crimes, we were working with a crime that worked quite um, a charity that worked quite closely with that government organisation. And quite often, um, people have had negative experiences get involved with charities as a way of, kind of like making things a bit better. So by working more closely with charity partners, you can then get access to those people. But um, it is difficult because you want to design for everyone, but it's not always easy to reach everyone. So yeah, I think trying to get um, like actual, I think we use like people for research or something for a lot of ours, but um, yeah, I would really just lean on charities and community groups because people want to be involved. They do want to make things better. And yeah, hopefully you can find one that kind of mirrors your organization or at least what the project's aiming for. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks Lauren. Um, so next question, we've got um, two questions from Catherine. Um, so I'll ask them both at once. <laughs> Do you think it's important to use the word trauma in discussing this topic or could that word itself be a blocker for some people? Um, that was Catherine's first question. Um, I feel like it probably could be a blocker. Like language is a really complex thing that does like impact people in different ways. Um, I hate to keep saying like doing research with people, um, but there's a quite a good way of understanding whether or not it is going to have a particular weight. So um, the, there was a bit that I was going to so use in that example before about um, the victims and witnesses service. When we were doing the research with them, with the participants we were working with, we wanted to switch out things like the consent forms because consent has a very specific meaning with that group of people. So um, we wanted to make sure that nothing we were saying could possibly start to like trigger those feelings so we swap out for like permission forms for instance so do you think i don't know because i was kind of tempted to even put like a trigger warning in this presentation but it's quite tricky to know people's different experiences so maybe that's probably a bit of like a learning thing for me but also um yeah just engaging with the people who are actually going to be engaging with your content and finding out what works for them and what kind of boundaries they have yeah yeah absolutely Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, the next question from Catherine. Uh, Catherine asks, uh, do you think AI could help us to make more trauma-informed services? And if so, how? That's a really complicated one. I think it depends on the... Um, I mean, if we created like a AI that was specifically for that, the problem with things like ChatGPT is that it's all based on existing content on the internet and the content on the internet isn't always great. So kind of getting all of that human element coming in too much. I think if you created one and trained it in a way that it could then kind of generate or structure content in a way that's a bit more inclusive, then maybe, but um, not um, tech, not, um, not good enough at AI to really give you a clear answer to that one, um, potentially. But I don't know, I think it's always gonna be a tool that we work with rather than something that creates the content for ourselves because I don't know, we're always gonna need that human element to 
review and make sure that it actually is working for people and then testing it with people um, yeah yeah absolutely i mean you certainly wouldn't want to have that automated <laughs> <laughs> um so our next question from um arnold uh, arnold asks um uh of all the different aspects um what do you find the most important in the website do you put that in a data model or do you measure the value of the aspects with the data oh so for example uh how is i think i think anna's question is kind of around um like what measurements do you use kind of in terms of like like for example is a word inclusive enough i think is and how and how is that measured or how or how do you determine that as a as a content writer um i'm not sure if there's like a metric or way of like actually quantifying like how inclusive a term is but i think actually like speaking to people from different communities, speaking to charities, speaking to community groups, then letting people kind of def decide for themselves, like what language they want to use to kind of like how they want to be referred to, for instance. So if there are like particular, um, if you, I don't know how to say that, like if you're wanting to be referred to in a certain way, just use the language that the person's using about themselves. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a way of like quantifying it but basically just do research, um, look online. Um, I think I think it was UNICEF I was looking at the other day. I've got a really good, massive document about inclusive language. So I think for cases like this, just kind of be led by people who know better um, and kind of don't be afraid to have to change some of the things or the way that you speak yourself. Um, yeah, there's lots of really good people who know what they're doing. <laughs> and so just kind of um, ask, yeah, basically look at their resources, I guess, and follow their lead. I don't know if that's answered the question or whether they're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, I don't think that does, and I suppose, you know, it's 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 always okay to ask as well, I think. Yeah, uh, that's true. Just, just ask people, right? is this the right um, way to talk to you? <laughs> um, so, uh, Kathy... Catherine here asks, so we've had a few more just drop in. Um, Catherine asks, could you tell us a bit more about your uh, kind of uh, your consent form wording work? Um, I know you, probably, you won't be able to get into specifics, but kind of around kind of the research around that. Um, I did um, have more information. So I think the we swapped a lot of the um language within the like permission form itself so it was the way that we referred to it because i swapped out um a lot of the language that felt too kind of uxy so i think we're talking about like user journeys which didn't really make sense to people so we swapped those out um generally just made sure that all of the content was written to the like, reading age of nine and um, well structured one thing we did as well was um we wanted to like lead with the importance of why they were doing the research and why we were asking them to do it so if you're just doing like a normal usability session, there might not be like a big kind of emotional um, like expectation, I guess, because like people were going to be having to talk about um, their experiences with the crime, even though it wasn't about the crime itself, there are still those kind of related emotions around it and it could be quite like emotionally taxing for them. So we wanted to begin with saying, like not only do you not have to do this, you can um, like play the leading, so we led with, how they were going to be helping people how the work was really important we then went into if you want to stop at any point you can if you want to take a break you can you can say at any point you don't want to do it anymore and just kind of all the different safeguarding measures we had in place to help people and then we went more into like the actual kind of practicalities of what the session would entail and the different um screens we'll be going through for the usability session the one thing we couldn't change was the data protection policy just because um it's a legal document <laughs> and I don't think we need to would have to change it in um, like a broader sense but people don't tend to read that stuff as much anyway so I think we slightly got away with it but um yeah I think I'm trying to think of what else we changed it was helpful for the participants we had in the sessions and it was good to have something that we kind of deploy more broadly especially when we're um working with um, like participants who are more vulnerable. I know we do do it for particular clients, but I don't know how much I can go into it without getting into trouble with them, the account management team. Um, 
but yeah basically there are measures we have in place to try and protect people who are from more um like vulnerable um user groups awesome thank you lauren um so we've got, just got time for one one more quick question um so joe asks um can i ask more about the choice between using uh the disabled people versus people who have a disability kind of as I uh, suggest as, as a social model of disability uses disabled people to signify how they are disabled by society uh this will vary from person to person perhaps there's no right answer but um but yeah but yeah do you have anything to kind of add add, add on that yes I think with this one it's more about that kind of it's centering the person rather than the disability there's a lot of um kind of conversation and thought around this at the moment where it's just kind of yeah centering the person i don't know if there is like a right answer and people want to be referred to in different ways there's no kind of blanket term or magic group of words for anyone i don't think but we can just ask people they're either using our service or um people are our participants like how they actually want to be referred to um yeah i think yeah, Joe, like you are right that there are kind of um, political and social and different kind of um, elements that are then piled onto language. So, yeah, I think, again, just leading and like being led by the groups you're referring to. So if I'm speaking to someone that wants to be referred to a certain way, that's the language I'm using. Um, I don't know if that helps. I think, yeah, it depend, depends on the person, but it's always just ask, ask your users, um, ask communities, that kind of thing. Um, yeah yeah absolutely thank you um so yeah that is just about all we have time for today um thank you lauren that's such a good talk it's so it's so much so much useful information there there is uh lots lots of love in the chat um from everyone that tuned in um again yeah yeah thank you to all of you that tuned in we'll we'll have the recording available for you asap so please do keep an eye on your emails for when that pops up um uh our next webinar will be hosted uh, by principal UX designer and illustrator here at Nementa, Emily Trotter. Um, she's going to be talking about all things sustainability and design. Um, if you caught her Interact London talk, uh, this webinar will look at the steps we've made um, uh, both as an industry uh, and agency since she spoke uh, since she first spoke about this in October. Um, if you've not seen her Interact talk yet, I highly recommend it. It is uh, up on our uh, on the Nementa YouTube channel. Uh, so please do check that out. Um, we. Uh, we've also launched Virtually, which is our free virtual web accessibility and digital inclusion conference, which is taking place uh, across three days on 14th to 16th of May. Um, you can find that um, over on our Eventbrite page, so please do sign up. It is free. And uh, Lauren is speaking again um, alongside <laughs> um, uh, uh, fellow principal content designer Hannah Atkinson. Uh, uh, alongside many many more um so yeah thank you um thank you everyone um and if anyone has any further questions for lauren i'm sure they can get you on on um on linkedin, um, LinkedIn. um brilliant brilliant well thank you everyone uh we'll see you next time yeah thanks so much for coming everybody bye-bye